how are you winning work and could we maybe buddy up to take on a slightly larger project? Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the great pleasure of welcoming back Business of Architecture UK favourite, Rob Fien, who is a London-based communications consultant uh, specialising in the world of architecture and design. Rob has over 15 years of experience working with the press. He's worked with print, online, broadcast media, um, local, national, international trade and consumer titles. He's deeply passionate about the built environment and has become a very powerful ally and advocate for architecture here in the UK. He's developed firm roots within the architectural community and has very strong relationships with key journalists institutions and clients. Um, this has earned him advisory roles for uh, organisations such as the Museum of Architecture, the London Society and Black Horse Workshop. And in today's episode, we ask this maestro of architecture, marketing and PR a little bit about his new book, which he has co-authored with Carl Buchanan and Melis Hayward of Archeo entitled Collective Action, The Power of Collaboration and Co-Design in Architecture. And really, this book is a collection of um, case studies showcasing the power of collaborative architecture and how good design processes can really lay the foundation for a better form of architecture. So we dissect the book a little bit. Rob tells us about how the book came into being um, and some of the strategies that practices can start to use um, to collaborate with other architecture firms, how they can use collaboration to help them win work, enter into new sectors, which perhaps they were struggling with before, how to share expertise um, and knowledge bases. And I think, you know, from our perspective at Business of Architecture, this idea of the network practice or these kinds of innovations with how architecture can be operating and how we can diversify and uh, expand and build upon a knowledge base and which is shared across many different types of smaller practices, this becomes a very powerful economic idea that can lead to a lot of success and open a lot more doors. So the information for Rob's book will be in the info of this podcast. So sit back, relax and enjoy Rob Fien. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Rob, welcome back to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. And today we're going to talk about um, a new book that you are one of the co-authors of. And so I was very excited to see this, very disappointed that I wasn't sent a copy in preparation for this uh, this conversation. But, you know, next time, next time we see each other. I'll have a signed book in hand. Exactly. That's, I would like that. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. But it looks fantastic. The book looks really, really brilliant. And I know that you and Carl and Melis, um, this was the theme of your guerrilla tactics um, uh, that you organised. When was that? A couple of years ago? Last year? Uh, that was, uh, I think it was 2021, because we were still um, pandemic doing it on Zoom. Right. Ah, right. Rather, okay. than, rather than in-person conference. And the theme of the book is obviously a topic that you're very passionate about. I know we've we've organised events in the past many moons ago with a similar sort of theme of this idea of collaboration, of collective action, of working with each other, this idea of a network, networked practice of architecture. And I think, you know, certainly in today's kind of practising climate, it's an ever more pertinent conversation to be to be driving and to be talking about, and certainly for small emerging practices, I mean, the power of collaboration is enormous. And with kind of internet life and uh, digital communities and the ability to be able to talk and communicate with people on the other side of the globe, all of this is becoming much more easier and at the touch of a button than ever before. So 
well, why don't we start with what was it that led you guys to number one curate the guerrilla tactics around this topic and two how did the book come about i think i think part of it is to do with business and the fact that what we saw there were two things happen, happening simultaneously particularly during the pandemic you were seeing um architects were getting a lot more activist and joining forces to sort of say well, like we're definitely greater than the sum of our parts and so um you were seeing people like the paradigm network who in the book um organizing to uh to share ideas about um making the profession more diverse you were seeing you know a growing role for the architects climate action network to talk about you know the, the cri climate crisis but we were also seeing more and more large practices collaborating with smaller practices um, and sharing work and to the point where not only not only was it good for the larger practices to to show that they had a sort of diversity of thought on projects but also clients were starting to demand it they've start, clients are, in the uk are certainly starting to say that they want to see teams of architects um, rather than this idea that there's one Norman Foster-esque super genius at the helm. There's this awareness that a large practice is lots of different people with different skills, but they might not have all of the skills to deliver a complex mixed use development. And therefore, if you bring in another practice, it's a whole different range of experiences. They might be better at community engagement, um, or they might be able to do a smaller part of the scheme, which is a bit more fiddly, a bit more infill. Mm -hmm. which is something that larger practices don't really do so often. So this idea, yes, yeah, so we saw these people working together and we thought, this all seems like a good topic for a conference. And um, the RIBA agreed, which is fantastic. It's very interesting, actually. So is this a trend that we're seeing in modern procurement that clients on all sorts of different types of projects are more and more interested in collaborative teams? Because in the past, We've often heard pushback, if you like, around collaboration because, you know, immediately there's a complication of, well, who's the one responsible or whose indemnity insurance do we use or what happens if one business goes, gets, goes bust and it kind of impacts the rest of them. There's all these kind of other technical um, aspects to it. But I'm, I'm quite delighted to hear that it's something that we're starting to see more in procurement. As yeah, I think, I, think it's, I think it's a good way around um uh the insurance is necessary for schemes of certain sizes mm -hmm. so um i think if a smaller practice partners with a larger practice i'm not sure they're i don't know the legalities of it i'm not sure they're taking on their individual risk but certainly the smaller practice is not probably delivering a giant project where the percentages of you know the overall cost would be much higher mm -hmm. so but I, I do think it's a way around i think certainly with um, public procurement and the frameworks that are involved, um, they, they, you can't even get on the framework unless, unless you can say that you have a certain amount of insurance, but a partnership on a team, you're basically a subcontractor. Mm -hmm. So you're, you don't, you don't really count as the kind of lead consultant. And of course, you know, most of your listeners will know any big practice that's led a team, there's, there's always going to be uh, quantity surveyors and engineers and everything who don't count as the as the lead design person. So why not have smaller practices on there? Yeah. And uh, I think it also is you're seeing as well with the public private partnerships as well. Mm -hmm. The you know, the, the local authorities are saying to developers like, look, if you want to do this, we want to see we want to see a broad, diverse set of people. We don't just want same old, same old. I think it's very interesting as well when you look at a lot of larger practices and the kind of relationship that they might have with smaller practices. And in many cases, when we're just talking about uh, RSHP, how many small practices that RSHP has kind of birthed, if you like. And it just kind of, you know, there's already a, an existing relationship and skill set and knowledge. And perhaps these businesses have broken away and have been able to pursue a much more niche level of expertise. But the relationship is still there and it brings a lot of, um, you know, just opens up an incredible amount of richness and possibility for for smaller patches to be involved in larger scale projects. 
Yeah, I think it's important to to note that this isn't all new. I mm-hmm. think informally, if you're if you're a small practice but you used to work at a larger practice and you've maintained good connections, I think people have been behind closed doors, been passing small work down for you know for decades and sort of saying like, look, this is too small a job for us, but are you up for it? And I think that's often how you see smaller practices getting interesting work, mm-hmm. you know, is because they don't have the networks, but they get introduced to people by their past employers. I think that's really nice. But I think what's even nicer is to see it happening out in the open mm-hmm. and, to, and to see that there, there being a few more sort of systems in place uh, to allow that. And I think, you know, there was a, you know, when the whole um, Black Lives Matter thing exploded, uh, internationally, you certainly saw in the UK, you saw um, local authorities immediately jumping into action and saying, OK, well, we've got to have greater ethnic diversity in our procurement processes. And they sort of they didn't change overnight, but it happened very, very quickly. And then I, I think what happened afterwards was people were demanding it. And then we had to figure out, well, how do we deliver greater diversity? And, you know, that might come through partnerships or new kinds of frameworks um uh and you know it's it, we're still in the early days of figuring this all out mm-hmm. for, for you and your co-authors what was what's been the mission or the intention of this conversation both with guerrilla tactics and with the book what is it that you want to see change or happen i think I think it's this shedding of uh, keeping things to yourselves. So I think Mm -hmm. what's really, and I think we were, you know, we've been impressed by others. So we've been inspired to do the conference in the book by the actions of others, as well as our own beliefs. So Feldenkleg Bradley came up with a carbon calculator tool, which is in the book. um, And they gave all that information away for free. You know, they set up a website, they hosted numerous events. They've probably still got more plans in the future, but they're not, they've taken all of their research and made it publicly available. And they're saying, rather than using their research to get a competitive edge commercially, they're saying, let's, let's, let's bring the whole profession up. Mm. And that's so wonderful. And I think maybe there are still some large practices that are playing catch up with that. Mm-hmm. In fact, and there are some small practices I know who are a bit timid to give away information. But I think Archeo have proved that they're a small practice. You know, my co-editors, Carla Mellis, yeah. they've proved that by just giving away everything they know, they just win more work mm. because people know how good they are. So they've got um, they've they've developed a toolkit for co-design, and you know, the first thing we did was hand the whole thing to a a magazine, the developer, and um, and they just ran it in its entirety. But that I don't think that's gonna that's gonna mean that's not gonna leverage Archeo's competitors to to beat them to market. Yeah, I think it's just gonna say to potential clients, these guys know what they're talking about. Yeah, it's just, it just kind of demonstrates their prowess of, of expertise by being transparent about what it is they're actually doing. I, I, I'm I'm right with you here on this you know, the kind of greater level of sharing opens the kind of, you know, if we take from the kind of tech world and open source idea and within architecture, the old guard of running a practice has been behind closed doors and keep our secrets to ourselves. And it hasn't, you know, it's kind of dissolving as we see, it's not really an effective way. Whereas, you know, developing resources and then being someone who's giving them out, it, it creates a tremendous amount of goodwill. And of course, as a marketing strategy, you're providing a lot of real genuine value um, and demonstrating expertise and education all in this, all at the same time. And I, then, I don't know if you remember the Wiki House by Architecture Zero Zero. Oh, yes. Yes. Which was kind of open source um, construction methods. And I think looking back on it, I think they were just too ahead of their time. I think... We, every, the, the whole industry was so kind of sort of fab, flabbergasted by this approach. But now that would be much more normalized. I think now we would see that and go, oh, yeah, it's just another another example of, of highly collaborative open source knowledge sharing. 
But yeah. I just at the time, I don't know when it was, it must have been oh, 10 or more years ago. At the time, we all thought, what are they doing? What's their angle? <laughs> yeah. It just seemed almost too generous. Um, but I think we've, the, the industry has matured. And, and, and Bride and Wood would be another good example of kind of being open source and, and sharing knowledge bases. And you know, even, even at, the, at the concern of perhaps their clients at the beginning, where you know they're working with a large pharmaceutical company for example and they're like what you're going to be publishing our kind of detail our building details for everyone else to see and the philosophy there was like well yeah we are because it's actually going to improve your project much faster because once we get into the habit of sharing and other people seeing stuff your you know we can benefit as well from the sharing and other people taking things adapting them using them testing them and it's like it's like kind of stress testing ideas much more rapidly for them to evolve more quickly. Um, yeah, it's it's funny. I was I was recently reading um, Neil Chassaw's uh, designs on democracy, hmm. which is a really great book about the interwar years of um, UK architecture. And you know they had um, Bauhaus guys coming over to the UK, obviously leaving Germany for particular reasons, political reasons, um, seeking asylum in the UK and America, and there being architects piling into Reba to find out about modernism. And, you know, and every detail, every ethos, every material being widely shared mm -hmm. and inspiring, an, you know, a, ne a next generation. So I think it is, historically, it makes sense. And maybe, you know, potentially maybe in the 80s and 90s in a sort of big capitalist boom we got a bit focused on competition uh, and now we're coming back around to this sort of um, open sharing hmm. so 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 what are some of the kind of industry problems that you see that collaboration and co-design can actually open up and solve well I think Obviously, if we want to, if we want to change, I guess, the look of architecture, like who's creating buildings and whether those, some of those people might not even be architects, mm -hmm. I think collaboration can do that because it basically empowers uh, people to get involved in the process at every level. Um, and then I think that's going to inspire a whole load of people to say, actually, maybe I could become an architect in the future. So I think that's incredibly powerful. Hmm. I think if you're talking to your client and saying, look, we should try this new um, method of construction, or we should try this new route of procurement. And they say, well, it does, it's not, it's non-traditional. It's not for me. And you can say, well, actually I've been collaborating with a friend who's delivered this 10 times and it's really, they've, they've honed it down to a fine art. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think in terms of, moving things forward uh technologically it's great um i think you know we're still working out the kinks in small and big practices <clears throat> collaborating um but imagine how good that's going to be for those smaller practices when they're applying for their next job and they can say well i have actually worked on a scheme for 400 units you know, and suddenly that that just jumps them up a level. So I think, and I think that's when I've worked with small practices in my day job, not not book writing. Mm -hmm. um, they've often said scaling up is the biggest challenge. You know, you get you might do a house extension, you might do a one-off house, you might do a you know a sort of house size flat scheme. But you kind of then you start to get a bit stuck. How do I scale up beyond that? Yeah. Uh, and so really, I think partnering with another organization to deliver a bigger project is a, is a fast track. Yeah. So actually um, opening up new work in new sectors, going outside of kind of your existing you know, portfolio of stuff that you're doing starts to become possible through through collaboration. What's the benefit for, for larger practices? What sorts of things would they be dealing with? Because some, sometimes I know on the surface of it, it can seem like it's a, uh, it's like one sided. Yeah, I think, I think what we've what we've what we've heard anecdotally and and is included in the book a bit with Karakusevich Carson, is that 
when you work in a larger practice, you are delivering projects at quite a scale, at, you know, at quite a speed. And I think there become set ways of doing things that you know work. And I think sometimes it's good to have, a, you know, a peer that you respect come in and shake things up a bit. Mm -hmm. And also um, maybe inspire some of the younger members of the team to think, actually, it's not just day in, day out, stair detailing. You know, I'm actually, I'm actually part of a sort of wider network of creat creative thought. <clears throat> um, so I, I, th I think, and, I, and ultimately, as well for larger practices, I think they're going to have happier clients. Yeah. What, so what would you suggest then? I mean, I like the idea that there's a, there's a toolkit for co-design. Co what, what, how do you begin to start collaborating with other practices? What are some of the things that need to be in place or the routes to actually making an effective collaboration? I think it's important to note that there is not one size fits all answer in collaboration. Uh, it's annoying that when you say that because, but you know, it, it is kind of highly bespoke and uh, in the book, there are lots of different forms of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think something I've discussed with Arke before is the most important thing is to, to start with an open mind. And I think anyone that goes into a collaborative working thinking they know what the end product is going to look like, having an idea in their head of what the building's going to be and how it's going to, how it's going to work. Uh, it's, you know, are not, they're not going to get the most out of the collab collaboration. They really need to sort of say, okay, let's first discuss, first listen to each other and then start the design process and, you know, and come at it with an open mind. And I think, um, uh, that's when you have the most successful collaboration. I mean, particularly with, with co-design, you almost have to let go, which mm -hmm. a lot of architects really struggle with. This idea that something might come out of the process that you don't even like. And if you try and steer it too much, um, uh, it's going to undermine the process. What What are some of the 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 risks then of collaboration or like when it doesn't work out what do what do people do and does that happen my internet sorry i think i lost you for a second there there you're back so just on so i know that it's is it getting a bit choppy your side i don't know if it's uh, yeah i don't know what's going on if it's my side or not it seems to be okay I seem to have okay connection. It will be it will be a very high fidelity recording anyway, so don't okay. don't worry. I know if it's just a bit choppy. Um, yeah. What are some of the the risks of collaboration, and have you seen or any kind of case studies of where it didn't work out, and what were some of the lessons from those unsuccessful collaborations? Yeah, we haven't. Funnily enough, we haven't put those in the book because we wanted to, the, the point of the design studio series to is to inspire um, people to new forms of practice. But, you know, more anecdotally, um, you do hear tell of uh, collaborations that have gone awry. And usually it's, I, I guess it usually comes down to the age old problems of uh, some, some egos, big egos, or sometimes people just not understanding. They're not, they're kind of a bit maybe they're not ready for change. Mm -hmm. um, and there can be issues when working with the client. What's what's the chain of command? So, uh, you know, I think there are some small practices who quite rightly feel that they should be treated as equal partners rather than as a subconsultant, even if legally that's what they are. Right. And I think it, it might undermine. So you might have a client who suddenly starts to, think less of the smaller practice because the larger practice is saying, Oh, don't worry. We'll just tow them. We'll just make them tow the party line. So I think, and then equally, if a, a small practice is less experienced in dealing with say, you know, a very complex uh, client, yeah, they might say that they might speak out of turn and upset the whole process. And then other people have to come in and sort of, you know, reset the apple cart. So I think, um, you know, I think it's not, always easy and, mm -hmm. and plain sailing, but equally there are huge opportunities. So, um, new practice who, who've done a really excellent essay in the book about 
um, scale. They, they, they've used kind of the traditional idea of scale, which architects love. They've done that to talk about different scales of collaboration. And what's interesting is they're based in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they're the local architect on the ground and they're partnering with a big London practice, they suddenly have a lot of authority and power and they're seeing the client more and they're on site more and they're dealing with the community more directly. And suddenly people have to say, well, hang a second, you're not necessarily the lead architect on this team, but you're becoming the most valued member of it. So um, I think that shift in power dynamic is great as well. And yeah. often welcome, welcomed by the larger practices who say, great, this is a really, this is kind of the nastiest, stickiest part of the job. And if you're willing to take that on, we'll just do the big designs, which mm -hmm. we're quite comfortable with. I think it's really interesting. And did you talk much about in the book about the kind of collaborations between, is it always... Are we looking more on focus with, with large and small and small and small? Do we talk about large and large as well? We, have, we haven't dealt with large and large. I think that's because the target market is more, you know, um, recent graduates and, and, and small practices, which is the same as guerrilla tactics, really. Sure. Um, so whenever we're talking about large practices in relation to small, but there is lots of, there is lots of small and small collaboration. And... I mean, essentially, I don't know if, what your listeners will think about this, but it's it's very good as a small practitioner, especially when you feel a bit alone and isolated, to get together with your peers, share solutions, and also have a good old moan, and 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 sort of say, well, how are you winning work, and um, and could we maybe buddy up to take on a slightly larger project, and who, you know, how are we going to work that work out the legalities of all of that, but. You know, I think that's immensely empowering for smaller practices. Um, and I think if you're prepared to be a bit honest about fees, it overall, it helps the profession. I don't think you're, if you trust your, your fellow architects, I don't think they're going to take that knowledge and suddenly undercut you Yeah. Uh, on the same job. I think the idea is to share that and, and hopefully kind of raise your, all yourselves up. It will, it will go in the opposite direction. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this is really interesting when, you know, and, you know, as being somebody who's facilitated lots of group events and, you know, a business of architecture, we do the same. Um, those kinds of just those dialogues of people in a room talking about and kind of opening up the, the bonnet of the, of the mechanisms of the, of the car, of their practice and sharing what's going on and what's working, what's not working and just bringing a level of transparency to it is incredibly powerful. Um, and just the camaraderie of it. I mean, we've, again, we're moving away from this old guard of architectural practice of everything must be kept a secret. And we don't talk to the younger members of the team um, about money and the profit and what's, what's going on. And, you know, it's not helpful when we're all in groups together and everyone's talking about how fantastic they're, their business is doing because the reality is you know it's that's not it's not real it's not real it's it's difficult and it's competitive and it's and it's and the more that there is open dialogue between each other then you realize actually you know what it makes a lot of sense to be operating like a like a unit in a team as opposed to individuals who are kind of struggling and pretending yeah i th i think i i think i'm I often make the mistake of thinking that people are better connected and networked than they are because my job as a PR is to go out and see people all the time. And I'm constantly talking to different practices and they're sort of quite open actually about how the business is and what they need to do to improve it. I guess because they're giving me a brief to, you know, to, yeah. for, for comms to support that, that goal. But so I sometimes mistakenly think it happens a lot, but there's a whole ton of practices, as you say, who are working away in isolation. And then the only time they come across their mates, they go, oh, yeah, here's a here's a picture of my success. But I'm not going to tell you about any of my struggles because it's yeah. too embarrassing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, it's interesting, say, we're talking, going back to this idea of, of large and large collaboration and using that as a model for smaller practices as well, because the large practices, this is what they do. They collaborate with each other. If we look at, say, I don't know, like a Rogers or a Foster's or even a Grimshaw type of practice, 
how they deliver their back end of their construction documentation, where they'll collaborate with a Pascal and Watson type of organization to do the delivery work or to do a large, large chunks of it. And you start to see, well, actually, these are these other hyper successful businesses, they are collaborating with each other and developing these kinds of of these these kinds of workflows, which have been very, you know, there's there's precedent there to kind of model from and to show that it's, you know, there's there's business prowess in it as well. Or there's business kind of uh, um, success with it. Well, yeah, I think I think I think America is more actually more sophisticated than Europe about this role of the executive architect. Hmm. Um, but I think we're starting to catch up now and you're starting to see that the the role of the executive architect is is getting um, gaining greater importance and notoriety because actually you're doing just as much hard work. And without the executive architect, you know, things might not get built. And that's a big problem in architecture. So, you know, and I, it's not it's not in the book, but, you know, I've been uh, recently dealing um, a little bit with the Camden High Line oh, where, yeah. you know, James Corner Field Operations in New York is um, collaborating with VPPR architects in London mm -hmm. as the sort of deliver delivery partner, I guess. And they said that that process has been so wonderful and collegiate and both you know and I've, I've heard this from both practices that they're both really enjoying the process mm -hmm. and it and it it feels like some I think sometimes people might be worried that there's a tension when you're not delivering a project but I, I don't think there always is I think sometimes it's actually a relief yeah that different skill sets are utilized in the right way yeah absolutely I mean I, I think it's certainly for a smaller practice as well to be involved like a consultant if you like where you're you're giving advice and guidance to someone else delivering something that's actually a very effective business model there's less risk involved in it you can get paid big money for doing it it's highly valuable people are very appreciative of it and there's less you know there's less liability on the line with it um, yeah and often you strike up a really great relationship with the client because the, you know you're having a cup of tea on site with them, you know, on a weekly, maybe daily basis. Yeah. And I think that those, you know, and that those relationships become invaluable. So with the curation of the book, how, how are you selecting the, the narratives that got told there? So we, I think we wanted to break it up, I guess, thematically. And then we looked, we wanted to look at examples of who was, we thought we're delivering these things in really interesting ways. And then Reba are, are quite good with their guidance of saying that we needed uh, uh, a national and international examples. Um, so for instance, we have a, a sort of co-housing scheme from Barcelona uh, designed by a, a practice called La Col, um, who they came to our attention because they, they won an architectural review emerging architecture prize um, but you know the project is absolutely incredible and totally inspirational and I would you know probably wouldn't pass building regs in the UK sadly but obviously is totally uh, buildable and you know incredibly safe mm -hmm. um, and so I think it's worth putting that in the book because it still inspires people um, you know to work in different ways and, you know, as I said, we've got um, practices across the length and breadth of the UK and activists as well. So um, Amy Francis Smith, who works with a lot of she sort of champions disability rights as an architect, you know, trying to improve um, how we design housing. And she's kind of on her own in Birmingham, but she's built up this incredible network of collaborators. And now she's achieving so much more than a large practice might be able to do in the same in the same industry. Mm. Well, so I, I think there's this idea of architects, not just reshaping how we do buildings, but how we impact wider society through via collaboration. Mm. Well, I love this idea of, you know, bringing in international teams and working collegiately with people in other countries and learning from other models where stuff has actually been done. It just opens up this enormous pool of, of, of resource. Um, I was chatting with 
Space and Matter, these guys in uh, the Netherlands, who have been, you know, quite extraordinary with, um, you know, self-initiated development projects and circular economy. And, you know, they've got their own um, kind of modular construction company. They've got their own real estate company. But they're kind of like in the confines of the Netherlands and the, the you know, what's available there. And they're starting to, you know, have this conversation with companies in the US or wanting to have com conversations with, with businesses in the US or in other parts of Europe in the UK market. And that becomes really like the potential and the possibility there of being able to, you know, tap into resource where, you know, you've got tried and tested examples of these sorts of projects that have been that have that actually been delivered. And then to be able to um, leverage that somewhere else on the globe is very exciting. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Yeah, and I, I think sometimes people get a bit bogged down with regulation and mm -hmm. other things where they think, they think, well, of course that's possible in the Netherlands or Denmark because they have very progressive governments and you know built environment rules. But actually, I would argue that it, all it does is challenge our our way of thinking. Yes. And we are starting to see progressive things happening, certainly at a local level in mm -hmm. the UK. And like this idea of community led housing is really taking off. And, you know, even Michael Gove saying, well, if you want to build it, build it yourselves, that actually works for us anyway. So, you know, we'd rather you just cracked on with it and didn't ask us to deliver it. So, yeah. you know, so I think, and, I, but I, you know, that, those that kind of you know i was told that in germany the sort of community led housing market is massively more experienced and sophisticated than it is in the uk mm -hmm. so there's that means if it is going to take off here we need to be looking at places like that to see how we deliver it yeah exactly and lever leveraging the leveraging the experience um in terms of this, go back to the, the Archeo's toolkit for co-design. What, what's the intention here with this? Is this like a step-by-step -step guide then for practices to figure out how best to be collaborating? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is the co-design toolkit is more aimed at um, working with, you know, communities and client groups. Right. So it's, that's more sort of, it's slightly different to the book where they're sort of saying, if you're going to, design something based on um you know the potential residents or the existing local community this is how you go about it and yeah it does have a sort of step-by-step -step guide um and it uh, it does sort of provide insight into how to begin even approaching it mm -hmm. um and so that yeah that is that is something they're they're basically willing to give away but also under the awareness that they've developed it so they're the experts and i think that's a i think that's a really good way to think about most architectural processes brilliant and so do you think then if you're in a small practice and you're wanting to enter into a new sector that the kind of way to go about it is start to identify larger practices or other practices that have already got that experience and just just pick up the phone or is there something more strategic no, I, I mean, I think, um, I, th I think, I think you can knock on doors. I've, I've found whenever I'm doing a, a piece of work or organizing an event, if I just approach people, you know, having done my research and being aware of who exactly who the right people might be before I even start, you know, trying to get through the receptionist. Um, I find that people are very open to having meetings and coffees and discussions and taking part in events. I think it's also worth looking around if there are talks and things going on in the subject that you're interested in. I would go and then go and grab a speaker afterwards and just sort of say, look, that's amazing. It's kind of like what we're doing, mm -hmm. uh, but on a different scale, would you like to have a coffee and chat? And I think you'll be surprised by how often people say yes. And that's probably because they've put themselves out there already. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, yeah, you will be surprised at the kind of how open the architecture industry actually is when, and, you know, people are always willing to, to communicate and talk about something interesting or for the potential for something. But I think, I think certainly it might even be worth starting 
with um, your peers, you know, starting with people who are about the same size and then just getting, being unafraid uh, to talk openly and then just getting some insider knowledge. We say, well, uh, yeah, we tried that with that practice or that engineer didn't really work out, but you might want to try these people. So I think, I think, and then you sort of maybe you go up the, the size scale. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be difficult if you were a sole practitioner knocking on the door of Grimshaw's and asking for a leg up. But I think certainly you can, uh, you would get there eventually. Amazing. So what's the, um, what's the plan now with the, with the book? You guys had a, an event a couple of months ago with the launch. So it's been launched. Um, uh, there's, we're now having discussions with the contributors to have more events because mm-hmm. RIBA has kind of done guerrilla tactics already on this topic. So they'll be looking for new topics in the future. Um, uh, but yeah, I think we're just uh, continuing to broaden that network. If I'm honest, so many people have come up to me with other examples of collaboration since. I feel like there should be a second book, but I might need to recover <laughs> for a while before I do that because, and maybe Reba do too, but because uh, making a book is, can be a long and arduous process. Um, but when you're, when it's finally done, seeing the sort of smiles on everyone's faces is uh, really wonderful and, and reading positive reviews as well in the press. Amazing. Brilliant. Well, an absolute, very fan, fascinating topic. And and if, you're, if your readers want, are interested, it's called Collective Action, The Power of Collaboration and Co-Design. Fantastic. I'll put all the details into the information in the podcast. Oh, a, excellent. Thank you. An easy to use link. That people could just click on it and get, purchase their copy. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Rob. Always a pleasure. No, you're welcome. Thanks, Ryan. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.